All right, so um, <clears throat> let's look at some scriptures about current events. Now, you know, lots of talk about the election, the uh, transitions, the cabinet picks, all that kind of stuff, uh, some of the things going on. And, you know, behind the scenes, we don't know all the details. We don't know exactly what's going on. I don't want to pretend that I have an inside track or anything like that. I'm guessing as much as you are. Uh, it does appear like, uh, once again, uh, there's a lot of obstacles to Trump in D.C. He's an outsider, and there's just a lot of the inside game that is opposing him. It's better than it was last time in some senses. Uh, and he does have, you know, the Republican House and Senate and even Supreme Court, in a sense, uh, in the White House. Uh, but even with that, there's just the inner workings and the deep state kind of mentality and all that. Uh, the administrative state that is an obstacle to him. So it just looks like there's a lot. And it doesn't look like there's just one issue. It looks like there's going to be plenty of issues. And so, again, we need to be praying for the leadership of our country, both sides. We need to be praying for wisdom and for peace and for sanity and for sound minds and all that kind of stuff to make decisions. We need to be lifting that up in prayer. And it's an important part that you have. You have, an, a, as the church, uh, our task of praying is a big deal. And you want to take it seriously. So pray for the transitions. There's a lot of possibilities of what could uh, really become uh, some wildfires, you know, in this transition. The big thing today, and it's a serious issue, uh, the fact that they uh, are allowing Ukraine to launch missiles uh, into Russia. And uh, yesterday, I guess, it was American-made missiles. Today, it was uh, U uh, the UK, um, Britain. <clears throat> Launch they launched missiles from there uh, or provided by them. And uh, from my understanding, some of those things required expertise from us. And so the involvement letter level really has uh, been taken by Russia uh, and her allies as a great offense uh, in uh, literally a proclamation of war. And the, so the threat of nuclear retaliation, it's real. And it's on the table. And it's just, you know, it, you, know you, you wonder, and part of this, you know, why would they be doing this with a, you know, a lame duck president? Obviously, oldest president in American history at the end of his term, you know, why would he be pushing America, and rather without any, it was there, there's like very little media, there's very little public announcement. These are serious issues. You would think there would be some kind of speech from the president, and there's just very little verbalized, and you know, obviously we all have thought this. He's not the one that's in control. He's not making decisions, so, but somebody is, and it's, it's really putting us on the cusp of, uh, you know, some real considerate uh, 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 tragic events, right? Some, it, it, there's a potential that there could be a city struck by a nuclear weapon, right? It could be Europe, it could be America even, and it's just like, or Britain even, you know, it's like, you know, those kind of ideas, <clears throat> it, it's just, it's very disturbing. So I, I, we need to pray for peace. We need to pray for protection. Um, we need to recognize how serious this is, and at the same time recognize this God's in control, right? It's, it's not something that you want to talk about. It's not something that you want to be a fear monger about. But it is something that our country should be taking seriously, and nobody seems to be, right? And, it's, uh, uh, and it seems like they're just sweeping it under the carpet. But th the threat is real. And um, I think that, uh, um, you know, w we're hoping that somehow, some way, peace wins out. We're hoping that some, somehow, some way that, Maybe Trump can get in there early and start speaking some kind of diplomatic, bring him to the table, talk peace. Uh, but there's just really, it seems like they're trying to set Trump up in the transitions that, you know, it won't be easy for him, that he'll have a bunch of wildfires, and not this is one major wildfire, uh, but there's others. There's economic threats. There's things that they could do that can make it harder and harder for him. Uh, at the last minute, they're pushing as many judges as they can you know, it's all that kind of stuff. You know, just, you're watching all that. They look like they're going to fight, try to fight every cabinet position possible. And, and yet, 
Uh, it seems like, you know, Trump is smart enough in his strategy and so forth, and he's got people around him that are very smart, where they, they know, I think they already know that these were their moves. You know, I, I don't know what their counter moves will be or their, uh, you know, what they'll do in response, but it seemed, I think that they strategized ahead and game planned this and, and knew that th these things were potentially on the table, but it's serious. And so uh, let's pray for wisdom. Let's pray for, again, sound minds uh, and, and recognize uh, the severity of our times. Even right now with <clears throat> the Biden administration, uh, they are limiting arms delivery to Israel. And there's things that Israel you know, would want and re you know, require. Uh, they can survive without it, but at the same time, they've, you know, this relationship has been set up. This has been the, what they've depended on, and the Biden administration continues to limit and slow walk all the deliveries and so forth. Now, the one good thing is, is there was a UN resolution to call for a ceasefire in the Gaza, uh, and the United States did veto that. We have that veto power still, and we vetoed that. And it didn't even discuss the freedom of the hostages. Didn't even bring it up that, you know, the, these nations were wanting to put this forth. And so, again, the UN body is just a, a proxy for uh, Islamic rage right now and is, um, uh, it's, you know, is, has been said before, the, the UN, you know, the united nothing type of thing is, is what's going on there. It really has no impact. And so, you know, you know, watching those kind of things, thankful that the administration did veto that, but they're still slow walking all these things uh, toward Israel. It seems like there's just the sense of it. There's a there's a bit of a lull in the media, uh, but this last week uh, Hezbollah has been successful at launching some missiles and getting some uh, strikes. Although they they seem to be very random, there's been continued miracles in Israel, where you know the casualties have been extremely low. Uh, you know even even you know some of the shrapnel that the, the even the uh, defense you know they shoot up these. Uh, anti-air uh, missile systems. They shoot those up and the, the shrapnel falls and it can injure people and it's amazing the miracles there. There's been a few casualties, but even like this last, I think it was this last day or so, uh, kindergarten, you know, where the kids would have been playing and uh, the kids were dismissed for some reason or, or the teacher heard the, heard the sounds and was moving the kids and, you know, the kids were in a spot but then moved and right after that, shrapnel landed right there and there would have been a lot of injuries and so just little miracles like that uh, continue to pray for the peace of Israel uh, <clears throat> I don't have maps tonight I intended to but I couldn't find a specific map but they're, they're trying to push Hezbollah back they're trying to get rid of their supply of weapons they have an immense stock of missiles uh, I've heard different estimates that they've knocked out like 80 uh, percent of their missiles and I'm not sure uh, there's still deliveries coming in they're trying to cut off their supply from the Syrian border, uh, and they seem to be successful at some of that. Uh, they're trying to, you, you see them still striking into Syria, Israel, uh, and they're, they've pushed up into the northern part, you know, just a little north of the border. Uh, it's not that long, but there's Latani River, and I misspoke a while back, I said 100 miles, it's 30 miles. The Latani River uh, runs across the, about 30 miles north of the of border of Israel, from Israel. And the UN 1701, I believe it was, resolution, that was supposed to be a demilitarized zone. It's occupied by UN uh, arms and so forth. I'm not peacekeepers, uh, but they have been useless. Uh, and in fact, puppets and helped a lot of this uh, Hezbollah movements. And so they've, Israel's been able to push into that area. And it looks like what they've done is they've kind of had a beachhead north of the border just a little bit, and then they're looping around. And it looks like they're trying to circle around Tyre uh, and uh, come up back to the coast so that they can cut off that area and kind of squeeze it uh, dry as well, cut off their supply. It's similar to what they did in the Gaza where they cut off the supply lines uh, and the escape routes in a sense. Uh, and so they're doing a similar thing there. But meanwhile, Lebanon, the government of Lebanon uh, is, you know, is, it's, Lebanon's not run by Hezbollah. Hezbollah is part of the governing system. They're a political party but they have opposition parties. There's Christian parties. Originally, when Lebanon was formed, it was supposed to be the Middle East home nation for the Christians. Uh, it's been overtaken by Hezbollah by a great portion. Uh, they uh, are in opposition. The Christian parties are in opposition with Lebanon, I mean, with Hezbollah. 
the Lebanese Christian parties are trying to make a peace deal with Israel right now. And it looks like there's some movement on that. So it'll be interesting to see if, if there's some kind of uh, form of a ceasefire with Lebanon, but there's still an active uh, front with Hezbollah itself, like they are more and more isolated. So uh, those things are in the works, but right now, uh, even with the diminished supply and the lack of leadership, Hezbollah uh, seemed to have a lot of success this week as far as launching missiles uh, and some of them getting through, and uh, UAVs as well, uh, drones and so forth. <clears throat> there's uh, concerns as well, not concerns, but there's seems that the strategies of Israel are going to start going into Iraq uh, with some strikes as well. More They've done a little bit, but more and more into Iraq. And so uh, what we're watching is, is this establishment of the prerequisite for Ezekiel 38. We've talked about this a lot. The prerequisite of Ezekiel 38, there's a war that's coming, prophesied, prophesied war, and uh, uh, Barry, Pastor Barry was here, and he believes it's Turkey and Iran. He's not so confident about Russia. Uh, and, and I don't say this disrespectfully, but he is a minority in that. Most, most commentators today think Russia is a major part of this and that that is where Gog Magog is centered. Uh, so anyways, that, that group of allies have never been allies before. They are now. They're in boots on the ground in Syria. But the Ezekiel 38 discusses that those, that group's going to come into the mountains of Israel. So that's through the border of Lebanon, Syria, into Israel, into the mountains of Israel. That's the Golan Heights. It's right north of the, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they're going to come in. And, you know, the question I asked Barry, and we didn't get enough time to really talk about it, but I don't, what is it that Israel, Israel right now, I mean, it's almost like a, a fly, a gnat could cross the border from Syria, and Israel would know and take it out, right? Uh, I don't know, what is it, what's the state of Israel going to be in Ezekiel 38 when there's an entire arm, group of armies crossing boots on the ground into the mountains of Israel, and Israel doesn't do anything? Uh, what, what happened to Israel that they're that, you know, vulnerable? Uh, so w w we, we have to figure that out. But one of the prerequisites that we have as well is that they are dwelling in peace and safety. And so is there, a, is there something... This war with Gaza, with the Hamas to the south, Hezbollah to the north, is, is there something of the, a finishing of this? Is there something of a piece of this? Because of dwelling in peace and safety, again, it's highlighted repeatedly in Ezekiel 38. It's a prerequisite for that to be fulfilled. So in the Trump administration coming in, you know, I really think, you know, already they're talking about how they're going to jump on this and they're going to be able to... Uh, uh, reignite the Abrahamic Accords, that they're going to be able to rework that and, and restart it. Uh, what's, the, what's his name, the son's name? The Antichrist? I'm sorry, what the? <laughs> Jared Kirshner. Right, his office is 666 Park Place. <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm not picking him at all, but it is ironic. But, uh, and I wasn't joking about that. It is his office. Anyways, uh, he could restart that. And, uh, you know, with Lebanon, with that loaded gun that's been pointed at Israel all these years, uh, with that removed, with Hamas removed uh, and, and peace reestablished, this could really change the Middle East as we've known it. And we need to see something change to bring Ezekiel 38 prerequisite uh, to the forefront. And so, again, I think that's the, as far as, God being in control, control and kings, hearts of kings in his hands, and different administrations coming and going, and it looks like chaos. It looks like, well, this administration was way over here on the left, and this one's coming in on the other side on the right, and, uh, you know, how is this even, you know, well, God's in control, and he's moving these uh, pieces into place, and that's one of the things that I think uh, the, Trump, the Trump administration will accomplish and will be uh, used by God to accomplish is the peace uh, that is required for Ezekiel 38. Uh, I think we're going to see that established uh, one way or another. Uh, now, not everything is, uh, you know, a bed of roses with this administration, and we have to be careful with that. I know that we're, we're pleased with a lot of the results, uh, but we're waiting for King Jesus. That's the solution we have, and he's, on the th he's sitting on the throne right now, and every president has strengths and weaknesses, and one of the things that I think that we have to be aware of 
even though there's a part of me that's excited about this, I want to remind you, uh, Elon Musk coming in uh, is a unique character. Um, he's in control of so much right now. Uh, and, you know, with, with uh, Twitter X now, uh, he has a, a major platform for voice. Uh, it's very much in control of the media. It looks like legacy media is, you know, on a ventilator. It, it looks like it's, it's cable channels. It looks like that's passe. It looks like those are going to go the wayside. Uh, MSNBC, CNN, their ratings have crashed. Uh, you know, the, it, it looks like there's a, a move in media that's going to change. And, and not only does uh, Elon Musk control a major facet uh, of that influence of the media, new media, but he also, he, I think he's going to control uh, the internet <laughs> uh, with Skylink, uh, with his, you know, have you seen the map? For, look up on Google, look up live, or just, uh, what's it called? What's his, what's his? Starlink. No, Starlink, yeah, I think. I, I knew it. Skynet. No, that's Terminator. <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, anyways, <laughs> you, you, you laugh. The, uh, but look up the map on Google. Just look up Google, look up uh, map of, of Starlink, you know, and you'll see the coverage is worldwide. Even the, the polls, although they're much lighter, but he's got full coverage. I don't even know how they launch anything through that net that he has up there, but um, it, he could turn it off. He could shut it down. He could do what he could control that. Uh, and, and, and he's an unelected official. <laughs> and he's stepping into a very powerful role. And I wouldn't be surprised that we're all going to be excited because he's doing a great job. Uh, very successful at uh, getting rid of government waste. I think, it's, I think he's going to do great with that Vivek guy. And I think they're going to do you know, just amazing things. I think it's going to be... Uh, even winning some of the uh, the, the uh, other side of the aisle, right? And I just think it's going to be rather successful, and uh, he's got influence. You know, when when um, they had issues with the space station and they had to rescue some, you know who they called? Uh, they didn't call NASA. They didn't call Russia. They called Elon Musk. Right? Just to think about the power that this guy has right now. And... I bring him up to mention, go, go with me to Revelation 17. <clears throat> I don't know if it's him. I don't think he's the Antichrist, so don't jump on me for that. I don't. And, and here's the thing, for any of you, just be very aware of this. The flow and the theme of Scripture, we want to follow it. We want to be true to the Word. The, tr the Word is our guide, and the, the Bible teaches us not to look for the Antichrist, but to look for Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no emphasis, uh, emphasis on trying to figure out who he is or any of that because we won't be here. <laughs> uh, so we're, our eyes are on Jesus Christ and, and him calling us home. Now, there is that sense that uh, the rapture being the, the preceding event before the tribulation, that we, I think we are seeing things set up for that antichrist system. I think we're watching it happen. You can hear the hoofbeats of the four horsemen. You can, you know, the, the sense of the approach of this is really close. Uh, there are ten kings that rise up, uh, and they don't have any thrones. They, and you'll see this in a second. Uh, traditionally, the church has thought, uh, those that believe in the, this uh, approach to the pre-tribulation rapture, traditionally has been thought the ten kings uh, out of the European Union or the revived Roman Empire, those kind of things, uh, that they would they would rise and they would give power to the Antichrist and so forth. Uh, th these ten horns, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, as we approach, we're getting closer. Things are getting more clear. Uh, as Daniel is told that knowledge will uh, be going to and fro, right? Knowledge will increase. And I think that primarily is with prophetic things because we're so close. We're seeing it clearer and clearer. I think that some of these kings, uh, and that might not be the appropriate term, but some of these kings that give power to the Antichrist, I think that they could be some of the oligarchs uh, that have power. And, and again, it might not be Elon Musk, but I think he's a great candidate just simply because of the infrastructure he controls in media, in the, with the Internet, with Starlink, with the SpaceX, you know, and, and all those kind of things. But as, as well, if he's successful with this Doge, 
uh, this, uh, you know, eliminating government waste and all those kind of things, uh, he'll be rather a heroic uh, figure, you know. And, and as you come to Revelation 17, just, and just to, for the sake of time, i got to cut to the chase. Verse 17 of chapter 17. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Uh, it, this section is talking about those ten kings. As, uh, it, it looks like they're going to be some kind of, uh, you know, ten regions of the earth, uh, ten uh, areas. It could be centered in Europe, but these ten areas, they're going to kind of administrate. I could see this sense of this kind of ascending with uh, some of the collapse uh, of uh, uh, the the woke, the uh, left, the uh, the liberal mentality. There could be uh, a, a rise of an administrative state that is cleaning house and cutting cost and has all this influence. They're seen as heroes, and here comes the Antichrist, and they, they bring him in as his new leader, and they give over their power to him. Here, you can have Starlink and SpaceX. It's just, it's a lot of conjecture there, but I just, we have to be very aware uh, the, again, God is moving the, his plan forward, and we're looking forward to Jesus Christ, right? And our solutions are not at the White House. Uh, they're in God's house, right? And so we're looking for God to move things forward. And so we can be hopeful uh, for some of the uh, political things that might happen with the new administration, but we need to be praying, and we need to be very aware. We're pilgrims. Uh, we're citizens of heaven, uh, and we're sojourning. We're we're headed home, right? So we have to be aware of those things. Put your hope in Jesus Christ. I think it's very important for us to not get so excited about the politics uh, and, uh, you know, the, all the things that can happen around that. We're, we need to be more willing to win people to Christ than to win a, win a political argument. And, and Christians, I'm telling you, we have to be really careful with this. I think there's a lot of us uh, that would uh, love to debate politics, but we won't say a word about Jesus to anybody. Uh, what are we doing, right? We need to be willing to share the love of Christ and share the gospel before we convince somebody who to vote for. So um, <clears throat> let's make sure that we have our, uh, our heads on straight and recognize there's a real sense here that uh, we have more time and we need to be sharing the gospel. Uh, now, as you consider that, go with me to, um, where do I want to turn? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, I want to finish Amos tonight, so you guys got to help me. Listen really fast, okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. You know, Paul's only here in Thessalonica for... Or as the Tarpon Spring says, Thessaloniki. Uh, he's only here in Thessaloniki for like three weeks, maybe four, uh, three Sabbaths, right? And in that short time, he's planning a church. He's starting this initial group, and he, it's obvious that he teaches them about the rapture prophecy. So it's priority for Paul, right? Uh, it's not something to, you know, push to the side. It's something that's on the forefront of Paul's heart to teach. And so he's, he says to them, verse 1 of chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Now you remember, we're, we don't know the day or hour, but the teaching of the word is you know the times and seasons, right? You can tell where we're headed. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 will tell you this way. Uh, don't forsake the assembling of uh, one another together as is in the habit of some but all the more as you see the day approaching. You see it, right? So we should be aware. Watchmen, verse 2 of First Thessalonians 5. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord uh, so comes as a thief in the night. Uh, Lee Brainerd, who we have coming in March, uh, has a teaching. Maybe I could talk to him about sharing on this, but... Um, the day of the Lord is not a, a, a one, you know, 24-hour time period. 
It's a, it's a time period. It's the time period of the tribulation. And the sunrise of that day is the rapture of the church. The beginnings is the, the twilight of the beginning of the day is the rapture of the church. And then the day proceeds. And it's interesting how he works through it. It's just you can see the day proceeding or progressing uh, through uh, the fullness of the seven years of tribulation. Uh, the day of the Lord, it, it begins that, that twinkling of the sunrise, begins with the rapture of the church, the morning star. I think that's significant. He says, uh, it comes as a thief in the night, verse 3, for when they say, when they, they pay attention to pronouns, our culture is telling us to pay attention to pronouns. Here's a one moment where you should, uh, right here, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. <clears throat> now, I'll pause there for a second, because at the beginning of our conversation, we're talking about rumors of war, right? And that's what Jesus said would happen. There's going to be wars and rumors of war. And we're, <laughs> here we are, rumoring, rumoring about, <laughs> spreading rumors. We don't know. It just seems like it's scary times. And we're watching that happen. But in this, there's this sense that the world is going to... What would it be? What would it, what would it take for the world to start talking about peace? There's got to be a break of the pattern right now that we're in, and hopefully it happens before real war. Uh, but I, I, I'm just presenting that, that there's going to be some break in this pattern where there's going to be this conversation around the world, this attitude around the world, peace and safety. Now, I think it, it could even just be simply... Uh, you know, the, the talks about, like, let's have peace and safety. Like, that's the conversation. Uh, not necessarily that we're in peace and safety, but we're, we're wanting it. We're talking about it. Diplomatically pushing it, right? When they say that, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And I have, I have no right to talk about those. So uh, you, you could just get, catch the idea that all of a sudden, it's time, right? And the husband's scrambling to find the keys and everything. And, and it says, and they shall not escape. Remember that, they shall not escape. But you, paying attention to pronouns, right? But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that, that this day should overtake you as a thief. So the world is shocked, we are not. Because like... Paul, so appropriately trained up and discipled this young church. We're doing the same. You guys, students of the word, you know what's going on. You're paying attention. Uh, you're, you're reading the scriptures. You know what uh, Jesus says about paying, being a watchman and paying attention to the signs of the time. You know, all those things that he prepared us, not that we'll freak out and be scared, but that we'll have peace, right? The, the saying that we've used again and again, not to scare us, but to prepare us. Right? So we aren't caught off guard. The world says peace and safety. Boom, destruction happens. What would cause that? But you, it says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day sh should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Right? It's time for us to be awake and aware, sharing the love of Christ, spreading the gospel. But let us watch and be sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us be, uh, uh, that let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith. And Paul loves the imagery of the armor of God, and love, and as that helmet of salvation, uh, that as a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake. Or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other with, or in edify one another, just as you are also doing. Uh, earlier it says with these words. Now, as you read that, the sense of this is that um, the world is caught off guard, the church escapes. Right? We're not here for the wrath of God. Why? And this is the doctrinal theological reason for this, because Jesus paid it all at the cross, right? We are not subject to it, so we are delivered from it. And the sense of this is that, you know, someone accuses us of escape, that's fine, I'm good with that. <laughs> Call me an escapist, right? And what it says here is, 
we obtain salvation. Now, I, th I thought I was saved. You are saved. Right? As, as a believer in Christ, you are saved. But there is an aspect of salvation that is yet to be obtained, and it is, it is that final part of the rescue, where we are rescued and we receive uh, this, this broken down body is transformed into a brand new body, right? We receive our glorified body. We are raptured up to be with the Lord. Uh, uh, we have yet to obtain that. As the body of Christ, is, we've yet to obtain that. So we are saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved, right? It's that sense of this. And so we are not here for the, the wrath. Uh, you know, the, the imagery of that just doesn't even make logical sense. It doesn't make doctrinal sense. And for us to have to go through any of it, that last verse that I pointed out would not be uh, a part of this conversation. Uh, if we were to say, okay, guys, get ready for the wrath. Uh, it's going to be bad. Most of the world's going to die. Uh, every mountain's going to be flattened. Uh, every island's going to disappear. Uh, the entire ocean's going to die, basically turn to blood. Uh, there's going to be hailstones and, and stars falling from the sky. It, it's just going to, you know, all, all that. Uh, so get ready for that. I just really wanted to comfort you with those words. Is that comforting? No. All right, what is comforting? Soon and very soon. Right, perhaps today. We're going to be with the Lord. Right, that sense of this, that, that's comforting. It's not even comforting to say, hey, get ready for the four horsemen because you're going to be here for that. You know, they're going to take you know, all the, the plagues and the famine and uh, war is going to come and, you know, all of that. That's not it. These words don't make sense unless we're not here for any of it, right? So we obtain salvation, rescue. Now, uh, likely on your next page, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, as you look at this, go down to verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist. This is one of the titles of the Antichrist, uh, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all uh, that is called God or that is worshipped, so he, that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself uh, that he is God. All right, so there, you know, the discussions of this, uh, somebody had confused the Thessalonians that they had missed this, that they're in the tribulation, that they missed the rapture, they were concerned about the, some people that had died and all that kind of stuff. And Paul's, you know, reminding them of what they already know. He's teaching them again. And he says, let no one deceive you, right? And that's one of the warnings of Christ. Interesting that they're deceived in the sense that they're confused about the timeline and the eschatology, the end times, right? Uh, so they're confused by that. Somebody's uh, led them astray and says, don't, don't be deceived. Just like Jesus said in the last days, don't be deceived. Uh, let... Uh, don't let anybody deceive you by any means. That day, and so it's a specific day, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. So the man of sin uh, is the Antichrist. Now, there's a lot of discussion, and I wish we could go to the other dis conversations in the Thessalonians about the, you know, the restrainer and so forth. We don't have time. But this conversation about the falling away. I just want to present to you something that uh, I've mentioned before, it's, it's, it's new to me, I, I haven't uh, uh, heard this earlier on, but for years, uh, the traditional approach to the idea of the falling away is the idea of Christians just walking away from the faith, right? That people just walk away from Christ, right? The, the church just begins to dwindle. Uh, and that approach, uh, that idea of it just, it, it's happening, it's a progression, uh, and a lot of people even talking about we're watching it happen. Right, well, we want to be careful and look, again, it says the falling away. And the idea of the, the, the Greek word there is a definitive article. Uh, so this idea of the falling away is not a, it's not, uh, you know, a trend. It's not something that's happened through the years. Uh, you know, it's not in phases. It's not something that's, 
you know, been a roller coaster ride through history. No, it is an event. It is the falling away. Now, there's a, a Baptist uh, prophecy guy, uh, Dr. Andy Woods, that uh, presented this. And there's a lot of people that have presented this through the years. This argument is one I'm familiar with, that the falling away could be translated as the rapture, as uh, I just should say the departure, right? Uh, uh, the early English translations, I think it was the Tyndale. Uh, I could be, it might have been a different one. But one of the early English translations that preceded the King James translated this phrase right here as the departure. And so there is a circle that makes the argument that this falling away that has to happen first is the rapture. Now, the problem with that, and uh, Lee Brainerd, who we're having in March, uh, he went through all the historical Greek writings of the time and uh, around that era and searched and found that it was, this word has never been used to describe the departure, a departure. Uh, so it's, it's, if this is a departure, this would be the only time that Greek word means that. And so Lee Brainerd does a pretty thorough argument to debunk that idea. So what is it? So I recently heard a presentation by uh, the guy that is part of Prophecy Watchers, uh, Mondo Gonzalez. I was able to meet him as well. He's a very nice guy. Um, he made a presentation. And this is something that's been around for a while. I just I had not read it. I guess there are writers, you know, way back in the 18, maybe even 1700s that were writing about this. But the idea of the being definitive, it's an event. It, the falling away is when the Jewish people signed the treaty, the covenant, with the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 9. It's the beginning of the tribulation. That's the falling away. When they fall away from their covenant with God and they sign the covenant with the Antichrist. Uh, it's a definitive event. And I think I'm very intrigued by that uh, because I have tried to you know, fit something into that, this idea for a while here and wasn't really pleased. So I'm not, not saying that I've worked through all of that, but I think that that, that is a potentially uh, good answer for what this falling away means. And so the day is not going to happen until the Antichrist is revealed and that falling away is the Kickstarter right where it begins. It's when the Jewish people sign a covenant, Daniel chapter 9, uh, with the Antichrist. Very interesting. Yeah, we will be out of here. We won't be here to see who he is. So all these people trying to figure out who the Antichrist is are wasting their time. We're looking for Jesus Christ. Amen.